so this meeting is joined. And I'm going to just Kevin Horror, who's the head of journalism and communication here, is just going to welcome Good evening, everyone. Good evening. You know, it's often the biggest form of disinformation to say it's a pleasure to launch an event. But this evening, it actually is a real pleasure to open this event for Harry and the Centre for Critical Literature here. And the Centre is playing a really stellar role, I think, in bringing debates like this to the fore on matters of concern to Irish media, Irish public, Irish society, and further field as well. It's only in existence a few years, Harry, five, six years is all, but already its reputation has grown beyond these four walls and out into other institutions, out into broader debates as well. I'm not going to introduce the speakers out there, the stellar panel lined up ahead of you. Um, so I know personally, some I have just met. Um, it would be Harry's privilege and pleasure to do that. So I just want to bid you welcome. It's a bit tricky here, but I'm sure the heat of debate will soon get things warmed up. And I hope you have a wonderful evening and a fine spirit of debate along with Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Kevin is a PR guy, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> after, after that talk. Um, so, um, as, as some of you are probably aware, uh, but some of you are probably not, this event is, uh, in addition to being a, uh, you know, a seminar of the Center for Critical Media Literacy and the School of Media here at TU Dublin, is a pre-conference satellite event for the Association of Internet Researchers uh, conference, which is happening here at TU Dublin this week. And uh, it was around the time that I found out um, a few months ago that the theme for that conference was decolonizing the internet. It was around that time that I got a, an email from a colleague uh, inviting us to invite our students to take part in a project called Public Editor, which was a gamified platform for identifying disinformation. And this gamified platform for identifying disinformation, if you read down the email from a nice nonprofit that was taking part uh, in this project, it's funded by the United States State Department Global Outreach Fund. So I thought that was that's interesting. There's a little decolonize the internet uh, sort of a, 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 a provocation, perhaps that the that a, a a platform where students are being invited to. Um, identify disinformation, presumably with the goal of destroying it uh, in a game in game form, was being funded by the US State Department and then being promoted by various NGOs and and uh, it must be said the uh, Berkeley Data Science Institute and other respectable academic uh, institutions. So I thought, yeah, maybe that's something that we can talk about in the context of decolonizing the Internet. Um, that the, the most powerful state in the world today has also uh, got an interest in helping us um, clean up disinformation and us helping them clean up disinformation. And then, but the other thing that struck me also uh, in terms of decolonization was the fact that journalism itself was being kind of invited to take on this role. Journalism students were being invited to take on this role. And I had a kind of my immediate reaction is, why don't we just at this point disband the teaching of journalism and just replace it with, you know, uh, gamified disinformation platforms? Because to a certain extent, journalism and especially journalism as it exists in a sort of a popular realm at the non-elite level, journalism has been pushed out to a huge extent by these sort of um, anti-disinformation and uh, fact-checking uh, routines. Indeed, uh, some, it, some journalists were quoted in a very good article on this last year as saying that their whole job now seems to be fact-checking the exact same platforms that are destroying their whole jobs. That journalism essentially being wrecked by social media and also being turned into a, an exercise in policing social media. So I thought again, this is, sounds like something that we should talk about. And I, I began to think about who would be really good to talk about that. And I knew a few people, and I'm gonna introduce them to you over the course of the evening. I'm gonna introduce them to you one at a time, but I, I, I will say 
that anything that I say and anything that each any of them say individually does not represent necessarily the opinion of all of us, nor of the Center for Critical Media Literacy, nor of the School of Media. This is a provocation, but it's sort of five different provocations, starting with mine, and then hopefully you guys will have some provocations to share as well in the conversation afterwards. We don't have we don't have a party line. Uh, but we do come at this question from variously critical perspectives. In other words, there's no one here who, among the speakers tonight who is doing disinformation studies, who is part of one of these uh, fact-checking initiatives. We have a mix of uh, people whose backgrounds are in media studies and philosophy and sociology and in journalism studies and in journalism practice itself. And I think that that mix, that critical uh, mix is going to bring us a really interesting discussion. And I will shut up now because the people who have really prepared proper talks here, each speaker uh, for a maximum of 15 minutes, are going to talk to you for the next hour or so. And we'll hopefully then have a nice bit of time for conversation at the end. So the first speaker tonight almost needs no introduction here in Ireland, but maybe some of you aren't from Ireland and, and could do with it. So I'll introduce you to Professor Helena Sheehan. She is Professor Emeritus from Dublin City University. She is one of the, one of the, the uh, most respected, esteemed, and, and long-standing media scholars in this country, writing wonderful things about Irish television, you know, not long after Irish television began back in the day. Sorry, I'm putting terrible years on Helena. It's not, that's not quite true. But, but also um, a, an academic philosopher, a historian of the philosophy of science, the author of a, of a number of really wonderful books. Uh, the, uh, I was just thinking that uh, I, I wanted to recommend her book on the uh, on Syriza, the Syriza wave, uh, to anyone who's interested in Greek politics uh, and in the evolution of Greek society over recent years. She's uh, an extraordinary uh, voice uh, as an activist on the left in Ireland. She was, uh, I, I first got to know her well, I think, when she was organizing Occupy University. Uh, out, on, out at Occupy Dame Street back in the glory days of Occupy in 2011. And, um, you know, so a real commitment to, um, to, to ideas and to praxis, a real commitment to, to um, making ideas real in the world and to bringing about the change, the change that she's fought for all her life. So I'm really very proud to be able to welcome to be the first speaker for this evening's seminar, Helena Sheehan. Thanks. Well, um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I hope I live up to it. Um, the current wave of interest uh, in disinformation is predicated on a perceived decline in truthfulness, even blatant deception in public discourse, sometimes called the post-truth society. Disinformation studies has emerged as a subdiscipline offering research funding and fast track career progression. There are many powerful players pushing the big disinfo agenda. I do think that political discourse is full of deceit and self-deception and that there has been a definite rise in this. But the dominant discourse surrounding disinformation and disinformation studies, I think, is blind to the historical presence of it, as well as the present pervasiveness of it. It typically focuses on social media rather than mainstream media as the source of the problem. But I want to focus on mainstream media as a source of a problem. Moreover, I think that the emphasis on information and disinformation, on facts and fact checking, on good and bad actors is quite shallow and misses the more insidious levels of deceit and self-deception in our public discourse. Yes, it is also blatant with Fox News, with Trump and QAnon. But looking back, I see the problem with NBC, ABC, CBS, and every president before and after Trump too. Here in Ireland, I see the problem with RTE, most parties in Doyle Aaron, and most academics here and abroad. My problem is not only with what the liberal consensus decries as fake news, 
It is what the liberal consensus considers non-fake news. Also, I think that disinformation studies represents a regression in media studies. In the early days of media studies, most of us in the field came from other disciplines, in my case, philosophy. For others, sociology, literature, politics, economics. We brought these other disciplines to bear and brought broader perspectives and deeper insights to bear on the themes we addressed. Of course, there are also plodding positivist studies doing content analysis and effects research based on crude conceptualization. The old hypodermic needle referenced by Harry in advertising this event is resurfacing in disinformation theory insofar as there is much in the way of theory and disinformation theory. There were different theoretical approaches to media studies all along. But when this was articulated, it sometimes yielded really provocative clashes of contending paradigms, something I haven't seen in a long time. Sometimes at media studies events in recent years, it's as if previous decades of media studies had never happened, even as if centuries of intellectual history had never happened. Bringing to it my own primary field, philosophy, I believe that it matters that so many in media studies and journalism are oblivious of developments in epistemology and philosophy of science. A whole generation seemed to know nothing of decades of debate about positivism, neo-positivism and post-positivism in which it has become clear that a fact is not such a simple thing as they seem to believe it is, which makes the current emphasis on facts and fact-checking seem somewhat simple-minded. The Irish Times declares, facts have no agenda. Wrong. Facts never come without context, without values, without underlying assumptions, without ideologies, without agendas. This is epistemology 101, not a module on offer these days, it seems. In whose interest is this unexamined assumption of the existence of value-free facts? It is in the interest of the system that conceals the nature of itself as a system. It is a debased positivism that prevails in disinformation studies and indeed in most social sciences. It isn't even decent positivism. It isn't even conscious of itself as positivism. Early positivism was motivated by a drive to cleanse knowledge, to formulate clear demarcation criteria, to be able to differentiate between valid and invalid truth claims. It faltered because its criteria were too narrow, not because criteria were unnecessary. Most of today's academics have never worked out what truth criteria animate their work. There are very few who have worked out their basic worldviews, so their work is unmoored. There is no core to it. There is a hollowness in whatever they produce. While I do believe that fact-checking has a role to play, it does not address the real deceptions and delusions of mainstream news and current affairs and the academic analysis of it. What needs to be examined and exposed are the underlying assumptions, the worldviews, the ideological positions taken for granted uh, that are involved, that are underneath the taken for granted news agendas and news values. We need to ask, what stories are being told? How are they being told? Why? What stories are not being told and why not? Unarticulated, often unconscious worldviews structure the unquestioned choices that shape news agendas. A pretend neutrality masks trenchant ideological positions. One that coincides with that of the masters of the universe, with the interests of all powerful markets. 
journalists and media academics proceed with naive notions of decontextualized information and depoliticized facts, thus concealing the realities of power and the nature of the system structuring what information is propagated, what counts as facts. I attended a book launch by Joe Duffy where he proclaimed that the answer to the problem of fake news is trusted brands. <laughs> RTE academic studies have confirmed is Ireland's most trusted brand. It is also because it is public service broadcasting, the news source we are entitled to hold to the highest standards. But is it really trustworthy? No. Every single day, I confront a news agenda that is skewed to the interest, to the ideological position of those in power, not only nationally, but globally. The problem with RTE is on many levels. Sometimes it is fake news, reports that are factually incorrect. For example, a somewhat violent demonstration against public health restrictions was reported as being from the far right and the far left. This, despite the position of the left on the whole, being for stricter public health restrictions. After a Twitter storm in which I participated, RTE and the Garda Commissioner reluctantly retracted that allegation. Going wider, in reporting on events in Busha, Zaporizhia, Mariupol, and the Nord Stream pipeline, where there are plausible counter narratives in play, RTE has reported implausible versions because they propagated, they are propagated by more powerful sources. Sometimes RTE proceeds by admission by omission, so often on so many levels of omission. But I'll give a simple example. Night after night, RTE covered Zelensky's addresses to every national parliament, <clears throat> including our own, where our own parliamentarians fawned on him unreservedly, except for a few who didn't stand. But RTE uttered not one word about what happened in the Greek parliament and then in the Cyprus parliament the next day, where it did not go so well. All afternoon, I tweeted to RTE newsroom asking if they were going to cover that story. Not one word. RTE reports and analyzes the war in Ukraine according to the position of the US, the EU, and the government of Ukraine. When did you hear one voice articulating the position of those in the east and south of that country alienated from post-2014 Ukraine? Or those who might tell of the suppression of media, trade unions, and left parties there? or those who might tell of arbitrary arrests, disappearances, and deaths of those who do not toe the line there, or anyone who analyzed how the U.S. has manipulated events there, especially since 2014, and how it suppresses any movement towards negotiations. As millions of people there in Ukraine and throughout the world live with economic impoverishment, ecological destruction, and nuclear fear as a result of this war, who is examining whose interests are being served by it, not only in Russia, but in Ukraine and in the USA? What are the epistemological and ethical criteria involved in designating Trump and Putin as bad actors, but not Biden and Zelensky? If I were to use such crude categories, I would designate them all bad actors. However, that does not get to the core of what's at stake here. The basic problem is the absence of analysis of the deeper historical forces structuring the flow of facts and events. This they fail to do every day on the Russia-Ukraine war and so many other stories. In their reporting on the death of that queen and other matters relating to royalty, they fawn. They act as if we were not a republic. They speak without the slightest hint of question about the legitimacy of monarchy, of the expropriation of commonwealth, of the violence and injustice underlying their wealth, their power, and their privilege. They use as if unproblematic terms such as free world, leader of the free world, international community, democratic nations. 
They take for granted that it is the US and not the UN that should lead the response. Indeed, lay down the law for whatever disputes arise in the world. They take a benign view of NATO and its role in pursuing US full spectrum domination. Even where RTE might seem less controversial, where they might seem to be doing a good job of public service broadcasting. They might do so on one level, but still they fail on deeper levels. Take COVID-19. Yes, they gave necessary public health information, but they endlessly reported the same information over and over. Um, the, the number of cases, the hospitalizations, the vaccinations, but they failed to address the systemic causes of the pandemic such as the whole capitalist system of agriculture and the lack of investment in public health infrastructure. They wasted every interview with Mike Ryan of the WHO, who has a good grasp of the geopolitics of public health, and asked him only questions where he would reiterate what the local experts were saying. On environmental matters, they deal only sporadically and superficially with them. There was a big focus on climate change during COP26, and then the next week there was nothing. It was as if the problem had disappeared. They will do the same soon with COP27. They never evoked the real scale of ecological crisis facing us. Even less do they probe the systemic causes of ecological crisis and what it might really take to reverse the worst that could happen to us because this might lead to querying the capitalist mode of production. I could go on and on about how RTE fails to produce truthful news and insightful analysis in its huge role in shaping our public discourse. But as I conclude, I want to ask now, where are academics in addressing the real problems with the mainstream news agenda? Disinformation studies tend to assume that disinformation is some kind of mysterious toxin in infecting an otherwise healthy media ecosystem. Because this is not the case, their proposed solutions will fail to get to the real issues. Their well-funded fact-checking schemes where social scientists team up with computer scientists will continue to arrive at conclusions confirming the liberal consensus that remains unexamined. Their emphasis on platform governance is grounded in liberal elite panic as social media giving access to a range of voices and views that are beyond their control. It is very problematic for this elite and those platforms to be the arbiters of what is legitimate public discourse. Their proposals for media literacy might seem a good idea, but not if such efforts are grounded in the same liberal assumptions going unexamined. Some disinformation studies do rise above this and go wider. There is a public access syllabus for critical disinformation studies at University of North Carolina, taking an approach grounded in history, culture and politics and raising questions about power. The Bernstein article in Harper's exposing the underlying assumptions and power relations of big, big disinfo is an important counterbalance to mainstream disinformation studies, as is the Bratich article arguing that the disinformation industry constitutes a war of restoration to counter the erosion of US global hegemony and the loss of credibility suffered by the political center. So I think that critical disinformation studies can make a contribution to media studies and media literacy, but I think that only the excavation of hidden ideologies will really get at the core of the deceptions structuring so much of our public discourse. Without that, journalists will only be stenographers of the surface and academics will only be puppets of the powerful. <laughs> I did say provocation, didn't I? <laughs> well, well, so thank you very, very much, Helena. And um, Helena rightly placed a big emphasis on RTE and on public service media, and that's going to be something of a theme for us tonight. I think that's really important in approaching uh, this, this question of disinformation and of how uh, 
the the liberal center maintains disinformation as it's uh, in this war of restoration. So our second speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Mark Cullinan. Um, Mark is a sociologist of media uh, who recently completed a uh, Government of Ireland postdoctoral fellowship here at TU Dublin, uh, funded by the Irish Research Council. He is, uh, his uh, doctoral research focused very strongly on RTE and uh, involved some really extraordinary new ethnographic insights into the operation of Ireland's public service broadcaster. And I know uh, uh, from the work that he's doing, um, authoring a new monograph, uh, bringing forward that work, that there's a lot of really exciting new thinking and new ideas that Mark is exploring about how public service media is coping with this particular moment, the moment that Helena contextualized so well in her talk uh, of international crisis of uh, global pandemic. Etc. So over to you, Mark, and I'm going to share Mark's um, presentation. Include computer sound, right? And there we go. Okay. <clears throat> Um, thanks, everyone. Um, after reading out with some incredulity, a listener submitted factoid about uh, actor Angela Lansbury upon her death earlier this month. Uh, the most prominent and the best remunerated uh, public service broadcasting professional in Ireland, Ryan Tuberty, allowed himself uh, a sudden brief detour to opine about the believability of information online. Clearly exercised about the issue, he said of the Wikipedia website the following. The main thing is, if you want to know anything about anyone, the first thing you do is don't look at Wikipedia, because that is the greatest heap of horseshit you'll ever read in a given day. And none of it's true. I mean, bits of it are true, but just stay away with it. Excuse the profanity, but it, 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 it's just so utterly unreliable and yet so commonly used as a source of truth. I find it, I find that remarkable. So if you want to know about Angela Lansbury, don't go there. Don't go there. So um, there you have it. Far be it for me to gain, say, uh, the broadcaster of Ryan Tuberty's uh, worth. I, I imagine I have to assume that an annual spend of half a million a year for the services of one independent contractor has to buy you an awful lot of sound judgment and media mouse. But if you too were to transgress his advice and consult the 10,000 word uh, Wikipedia resource in question, uh, and perhaps summoning up the spirit of Jessica Fletcher with just a few clips, uh, a few clicks, uh, you could find some clues to the credibility of, of the resource. Clues like uh, the no less than 261 cited references for assertions made in the text. It's featured status on the front page of wikipedia.com uh, the day she died the completion of its peer review process and its long held good article status arising from its compliance with assessment criteria <coughs> around accuracy, neutrality, verifiability and the stability of the article, i.e. there weren't kind of edit wars going on the page. With another click, we'd see uh, the entire edit history of the article they bear uh, and we'd see aspects of its, uh, we can see aspects of its production process over the years including evidence of amateur Wikipedia contributors passing editorial and aesthetic judgments uh, on its content and performing maintenance on the page, like removing dead links and so on. Honestly, have we ever seen such a heap of horseshit? <laughs> now, I don't know if Ryan Tuberty uh, knows or cares about any of this, um, or, or even the wider debates and, and evidence we have about Wikipedia's informational credibility as a, as a relative, relative credibility as an encyclopedia. Um, but what I find interesting is uh, the readiness to kind of spit fire on the public airwaves uh, about what is its flaws and limitations notwithstanding, probably the closest thing we have to uh, a global internet based public utility, an unparalleled project of collaborative and decentralized knowledge production uh, that has survived the wider corporate enclosure of the internet. But his broadside isn't really what I want to talk about today, it's more about what it represents and what it signifies. It's just one particularly vivid example, I believe, of uh, a repudiation of the logics and implications of decentralized many-to-many -many communications that impels a wider institutional and professional set of preoccupations and responses 
to our transformed information, uh, informational environments of the kind that Lena was speaking about. Um, in the RT context, the public survey con context, this matters for all sorts of reasons, because not least because it is two incumbent national public service broadcasting organizations that national and supranational political authorities are increasingly turning to as key partners in the wider fight against information disorders writ large, uh, exemplified by this 2019 uh, Council of Europe declaration. <clears throat> and as creations of public policy, and yes, to use Sean Lamas's infamous phrase, instruments of public policy, as we had, we had in COVID-19, uh, there's absolutely no question that it was part of the governance structure of, of how, how Ireland got through it. Um, and as usually the most trusted organisations, media organisations in their countries, by criteria, by conventional criteria, and I've written critically on what, what trust uh, means, involves and signifies elsewhere, um, public service media organisations are on paper very as well placed as any institution to credibly intervene in these information disorders. Um, now, there's no single expression of RT's perspective on what ails the public sphere and democracy more generally, but I think there's enough in the public domain to, usual, to usefully trace some of the key uh, contours. And what I tend to see is very consistent with what Jokan Farkas and Yannick Shu in their recent book describe as hegemonic discourses of post-truth, uh, widely adopted in the media industries, in academia uh, and in politics after 2016. The defining feature of these discourses is that they lay at the feet of the platformized web uh, and the algorithmically circulated, uh, algorithmically shaped circulation of, of information. A long chart sheet that includes everything from unleashing uh, an infosphere polluting tidal wave of untruth in the form of various forms of mis, dis and malinformation to a decline of rational thinking, reduced openness to engagement with different political perspectives, um, fomenting mistrust in institutions and authorities, deepening political polarization and encouraging populism and extremism. In RT, we can see it corporately from the very top in what has become a pretty rote uh, series of uh, recitations uh, of the received wisdom of post-truth, even if it's quite frustratingly vague. You never, you never really find out who the antagonists are most of the time. Um, so here we have Dee Forbes and Moya Doherty uh, in these five years apart commenting on this. We see the same causal chain of democratic threats in RT's, RT's, RT journalism's account of what's going on, including from its trade unionism. It's quite disappointing. Um, and you can see here the same sort of same sort of points. Social media produces these issues, produces polarization and so on. Um, and we also see it in the recent Truth Matters marketing and editorial uh, initiative run by RT News's current affairs uh, division. <clears throat> the wider campaign um, expands on the themes of the TV ad you've no doubt seen multiple times. Um, it conjures up a dark vista of some sort of in-progress uh, process of de-enlightenment in which disinformation has become the poison in the bloodstream of societies where conspiracism is helping drive polarization, deception and fear, this is, these are their words, all driven by the rage and noise in social media, their words. Uh, and where RT was in a war, not just fighting for journalism, but to protect the sanctity of truth itself. So what's the problem with all this? Well, firstly, I want to suggest that post-truth discourses of this nature are basically, basically unserious, uh, as, as kind of Helena diverted to, and, and very extremely self-serving. The sudden arrival of an exogenous threat to democracy and to reason itself offers journalism an all too convenient redemption narrative for a profession that has been long under uh, increasing strain. It neatly absolves journalism from having to confront challenges either to the legitimacy of its gatekeeper role in a digital age or to the epistemological underpinnings of its claims to value free impartial objective knowledge. Post-truth discourses represent a big bet by journalism, that the traditional model of its relationship with the public, that trusteeship model, where a willing audience and public gives up that trust and says, you supply my, my informational needs. I don't need to know how you do it. You just do it and you, you, I trust you. I trust you to do so. It, it's a big bet that this can be recuperated and that it can serve as the basis of journalism's pact with society into the future. Here, at least, we have consistency from RT and, to be honest, much more widely in Irish international media. Um, RT in common with its competitors has eschewed even the most modest transparency or particip participation enhancing measures 
to respond to diminishing journalistic and institutional authority. And even now, it is quite incredibly, considering the existential stakes it has raised around the dissolving status of truth, it has basically absented itself from contributing in any substantive form to any media and information literacy initiatives of, of substance. And I think that tells us quite a lot. Um, RTE's enrollment as part of the Truth Matters initiative in the International Journalism Transparency Initiative project, very bullishly introduced by RTE as the dawn of a new era, of a, a, new, um, a new era of transparency, a new maturity in its relationship with its public, to use its own words. This only shows how little is to actually change. The scheme which certifies the trustworthiness of journalism in media outlets uh, following initial self-assessment of basic professional standards has been repeatedly described by RTE as akin to the board via quality mark, designed to promote at a glance consumer confidence in the journalism product. This is about trusting in the brand, as Alina said. Given there's nothing in the transparency report that isn't actually publicly available on its website, uh, and I've looked, um, its imagined audience for this kind of stuff is very clearly an audience who would rather not know how the sausage is made, but one who might simply be persuaded to renew their trust in the producer with the right nudge. Who needs media literacy when we can simply trust in the brand, trust in the badge? But brand positioning uh, posing as media reform is just the first issue with the logics and implications of post-truth discourses. Of much more fundamental significance is that they rest on a series of very tangent tendentious premises, misapprehensions and convenient elisions. The evidence, for example, uh, of the effectiveness of kind of quality marks uh, and how they might influence individual decision making about source selection online is not good. More broadly, an emerging in critical literature has raised, for example, how the post-truth argument that social media are dynamos of polarization. It invests uh, in algorithmic black boxes of the social web, uh, powers of manipulability that the balance of evidence has not borne out. I think that's a problem too. The likes of Johan Farkas, who I mentioned earlier, Marcus Gilroy Ware and others have helpfully challenged the ahistoricism of hypothesis hypotheses like those around the myth of an epistemically stable past or of online filter bubbles in a world where media choices, newspapers, radio and so on, have always been heavily shaped by the human impulse for homophily or sameness. We go for things that, that we recognise. They have highlighted how the media centrism and information centrism of these discourses in designating the internet as the primary driver of social change obscures the salience and the generative role of culture, political economy, and endogenous forms of democratic decline in explaining current developments. They also question the attachment of post-truth discourses to the liberal rationalist and idealist notion of democracy as being premised on this some sort of unproblematic relationship to facticity. How they offer a poor framework, even on their own terms, for understanding the conditions of emergence or the appeal of structured forms of untruth, such as conspiracy theories. They more generally undervalue and misunderstand the legitimate and unavoidable role of affect and emotion in our engagement with politics. For example, in attributing only the most negative of qualities to uh, phenomena like populism, which are quite complex. Third is that as largely imported narratives, post-truth discourses have a particularly questionable and even dangerous applicability to local circumstances here in Ireland. When you consider various factors like Ireland's unusual degree of political stability, the enduring hegemony of centre ground politics, resilient levels of trust in mainstream media sources and a very limited partisan media ecosystem online and off, it seems reasonable to me anyway to note, as the uh, recent Future of Media Commission did, that Ireland may not be in the grip of the kind of de-enlightenment that post-truth discourses imply. So what is it? Drawing on imported pat narratives of post-truth or going further and describing Ireland as some sort of global ground zero for the spread of conspirator conspiratorial thought during the pandemic, as RTE's recently departed head of news did in an on-the-record interview with me uh, over the summer may not be simply be an overheated analysis at odds with the exceptionalist narratives uh, around Ireland's high trust in science, the high vaccine take up and the social cohesion uh, around the pandemic. But it's a dangerous one and I think counterproductive for journalism. Declaring a state of informational emergency and diagnosing a decline of public rationality 
at the precise moment of the historic decline in the political hegemony of Ireland's two traditional parties of power, which is the moment we're at right now, means that post-truth discourses are likely to be quite widely perceived as more than a simple concern for democracy and truth, but as a political intervention in and of themselves. The more fervently the war for truth is prosecuted, the more the shared reality it wishes to preserve feels coercively imposed, and the more its political valences, which are pretty manifestly in support of centrist, consensual and technocratic uh, politics, broadly speaking, they're likely to be accentuated and, and, and understood that way by large sections of the public. So whether we see this as a strategic and determined offensive war of restoration in the terms uh, of Jack Radish, as Athena mentioned, or a half, half-hearted rear, rearguard action on behalf of, kind of a de decaying centre. This is about governability, and it risks inviting the development of the same polarisation that it elsewhere disavows. By mapping a, a dichotomy of the uninformed uh, and the, uh, the, sorry, the informed, the uninformed and the, and the misinformed onto what Will Davies describes as a cultural battleground split into the elite-led politics of facts versus the populist politics of feeling. And finally, considering the shortcomings of post-truth discourses as a diagnosis, it's unsurprising that it's going to inform bad policy. And I'm, I'm looking forward particularly to discussing this aspect uh, in the discussion later, hopefully, uh, with those who are at the coal face of this. The often muddied definitional boundaries between fake news and politically inconvenient speech, which post-truth discourses inevitably struggle to distinguish between, have been readily exploited, for example, to justify expanded regimes of state censorship in more authoritarian states and less, both within Europe's borders and outside them. Kate Thomas and her colleagues have recently shown how policy discourses in the US and the UK around, around digital threats to democracy <coughs> suffer from a lack of conceptual precision, are blinded by, by their own liberal universalism, and lack much of an, of, of an awareness about how to reconcile legitimate tensions between democratic values. And um, to use Farkas's language, this means that oft, too often we resort to policing type responses towards online speech, pretty blithely displacing complex and fundamentally political questions of expression and speech uh, into legal regulatory venues. And we see this in Ireland too, and I'm going to finish up on this point. I detect in RTE's contributions to the pre-legislative process around the current online safety and media regulation bill before the Oireachtas, an expansionist approach to defining online harm, to include this information, to include fake news, whatever these things are, as well as a more general tendency towards imposing analog logics into the digital sphere and to regulate online speech, uh, broadly speaking, according to in, in the image of broadcast media. I think that trying to inscribe many of the logics of public service broadcasting, traditional uh, model of pluralism, discursive mediation, and the existing BAI regulatory model we have here onto the social web is quite the reach, especially as the limits, the limits of those logics have come increasingly into view over the last number of years. Public service broadcasters everywhere, including RTE, have struggled to mediate political, so socio-cultural and economic fault lines that are developing in our societies, as well as those that have existed long before. In RTE's case, this has even contributed very handsomely to the funding crisis, which now threatens its very institutional future. So it's little wonder, perhaps, that faced with the ungovernable masses online, uh, a techno-pessimism informs and pervades RTE's own strategic vision for, the, for its own institutional uh, future. Uh, and its own strategic uh, plan uh, offers this repast to the age of social media. Talking to Joe on Liveline, it seems, is about as demotic and pluralistic a venue of public communication as public media is able to bear or seemingly able to imagine. Um, I think this is a problem. I think this is something we need to talk about and think about a lot because we, we can't uh, concede the internet to the big platforms. Uh, there has to be a public option. And I don't think the public option is going to be talking to Joe. I think we need something a little bit better. Um, uh, I, I suppose for the rest of us in the meantime, there's always Wikipedia. Just don't tell Ryan Toberty. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. And um, the um, the focus on uh, public service media uh, continues to a certain extent with our next 
speaker, but also I think bringing in the social media uh, aspect more as well, which I know is something I'm sure is is bouncing around in people's heads quite a lot, particularly those who were at the uh, platform governance uh, workshop earlier today. So our next speaker is Dr. Jenny Hauser. Jenny uh, completed her doctorate here in uh, what was DIT uh, in 20. T now T U Dublin in what was it 2017? 2019. And whenever it was, it was great. And um, and uh, she has she is the uh, epitome of what we'd like to uh, educate here, which is critical practitioners, uh, including uh, working as a journalist with doing verification with uh, with Storyful, doing editing work and doing now serving as a part of public service broadcasting uh, consortium as well. So very much the kind of uh, um, researcher practitioner that we love to see around here. So I'm very, very happy to introduce Dr. Jane Hauser. Okay, I managed to leave my printer at home. I'm just going to have to get this one. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about, uh, or what I'm going to present here is, fun, is actually um, a proposal that I have put together for research, for the research that I want to, um, that I want to carry out, um, potentially as a postdoc. Um, and uh, so this is really not so much about kind of um, any conclusions, but rather about, um, you know, asking questions, asking questions about the uh, change in discourse around public uh, participation uh, by social media platforms. So how social me media platforms have actually adapted or um, their, how they talk about, you know, public participation and uh, speech on their on their platforms. Um, public and academic discourse about uh, public participation and news production and distribution on social media platforms um, has evolved significantly in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and I'm going to probably go to the next. Oh, no, wrong one. That one. Um, in the last 15 to 20 years, initially, widespread, there was widespread op optimism um, that saw civic engagement online as ushering in a revitalized democracy. Um, and this was done very much a vault phase. Now, the spread of disinformation and all its variants. Um, on social media platforms is seen as one of the main, if not the main, threat to contemporary democracy. Where there was a belief in the hive mind, as it was called, um, that saw participation um, like a law of nature lead to the truth, or truth, singular, um, uppercase, has transitioned to armies of moderators and fact checkers employed by major social media platforms, removing or labeling content with warnings and links. So um, what I'm proposing is to investigate the evolution of discourse by major social media platforms over the last 15 years in the communication of community guidelines and the um, regulation or what's usually referred to as moderation of user activity. And this it will pri uh, primarily ask two questions. Firstly, how is discourse by social media platforms around positive democratic and undemocratic speech evolved? And secondly, how does this discourse overla overlap with or, um, or digress from how legacy news media view and treat information production by users on platforms. Um, a critical discourse analysis, uh, so what I'm looking to do is a critical discourse analysis of material that's being released by um, into the public domain by social media companies um, to uh, see how thinking and communication around popular participation and its regulation changed over time and discern um, when and why the critical or when, where and why the uh, critical junctures occurred. So um, one of the, um, one of the, uh, one of the, initiatives or uh, projects that I'm looking at specifically is um, the Trusted News initi Initiative. Um, this is uh, where I see one of these institutional junctures in the establishment in Europe in 2019 with the, tr the Trusted News in Initiative, which is uh, spearheaded by the BBC. 
um, and it brings together a host of media outlets with the three most powerful online platforms. Um, Meta, formerly Facebook, Google, Google YouTube and Twitter. And it describes itself as the only forum in the world of its kind designed to take on disinformation in real time. And really it's a collaboration between, um, between uh, news media um, or very large, what would be considered legacy news media together with these platforms. Um, and it's, uh, it's about communicating, it's communicating um, instances of disinformation or what would be considered um maybe a threat to well as per the framework that they have a threat to democracy um and alerting mainly from the news organization side the um platforms about this um to kind of um so that action is taken um so really um by looking at that is uh, you know how is legacy media and social media um how are they have been how have they moved in order to resolve earlier conflicts by coming together to address perceived problems in the production and dissemination of news um and i think it's also worth asking what effects such partnerships may have on user activity so the trust and news initiative is really not the first of its kind the first partnership between um between social media and uh like traditional media mainstream news media whatever you want to call it um, there have obviously also been others such as um, such as the Facebook Journalism Project or the Google News Initiative. However, this is really the first such collaboration that it has been initiated um, by, well, the first one that I'm aware of, of that scale, that has been initiated by um, mainstream news media, or what's often referred to as mainstream news media. Um, in the early days of a now dominant major social media platforms, there was much enthusiasm for users' ac active role in producing and distributing news content. Bruins uh, described the producer, producers um, in the electronic agora, um, and they were seen as creating a sort of hybrid news environment characterized by collaboration between legacy news media and ordinary citizens. Um, legacy media's reliance on news, uh, news consumers to help distribute content through their networks by virtue of their interconnectedness was seen as ultimately empowering, uh, lifting news audiences out of the science forced on them by one-way mass communication. So what and how content was shared could be understood as giving direct feedback to legacy news media and contributing to reporting, agenda setting, um, and creating meaning around newsworthy issues or events. Um, at the time, or sort of some of the some of the uh, phrases that were coined at the time was sort of the people formerly known as the audience, or uh, simply the former audience, um, and that really captured an enthusiasm for what could be understood as uh, the end of passive news consumption. So, what happened to these? Uh, what Papa Carisi um, called the affective news streams, which characterized our social media feed, uh, feeds as the sort of self-correcting pastiche of uh, bits of information that, in, in its entirety, would provide much more co comprehensive news through the power of participation. Um, in an editorial in 2013, the Guardian editor in chief, editor in chief Catherine Viner, um, chided journalists um, who were pursuing the blue tick on Twitter. Uh, for trying to place themselves above other ordinary users. Um, and it really chimed with the mood of the day and arguably the preferred sentiment um, of big tech at the time. Uh, these journalists were not in keeping with the spirit of participation as equals. Um, however, only three years later, mainstream media's attitude pretty much uh, um, changed uh, towards social media. Um, and became much more guarded, and that was evident in Viner's address to uh, mm, God, Annenberg School, was it? Was it? Is that what it's called? Yeah, Annenberg School. Um, seeing in it the virulent deprofessionalization of journalism. So journalists turned their efforts towards reinforcing their right to claim authority through their own interpretive communities. Um, and really, but professional boundary work uh, assumed an important role in news work. And I would argue uh, became a major characteristic of collaborative news work between uh, social media users, non-professional uh, journalists, well, non-professionals basically, and professional journalists. So while the fundamentals of post, like, and share haven't changed, and research into filter bubbles and echo chambers through algorithms and self-selected networks really remain so inc inconclusive um, that you know it really questions whether there's any truth or if it has any relevance uh, to this perceived crisis in democracy. Um, and yet social media platforms have moved to adopt a sort of 
almost like a pseudo social responsibility model towards uh, users activities that borrows from discourses around professional journalism. Um, and what I'm interested in is um, to investigate the possible convergence in this dis discourse around speech and knowledge production between major sector uh, sectors of the media industry. Um, it, yeah. So uh, the timing of scholarly endeavours to distinguish types of disinformation and categorise um, categorize them can be understood in the context of maybe Donald Trump's election in 2016. Um, so he, uh, Trump's appropriation of the term fake news and its use as labelling mainstream news media um, as inherently biased arguably gave rise to a feel of urgency around defining qualifying forms of inaccurate information toward of attacks on the authority of legacy media. Um, the term fake news, uh, which was already a popular descriptor used widely by news outlets prior to 2016, um, was essentially rendered useless as competing political camps scrambled for control over dominant social and political discourses. Uh, right, yes. Um, so the developing scholarly discourse around what defines uh, fake news and the difficulty in establishing distinctions between different types has more recently given rise to the term counter media. Um, and for me, this is perhaps the best uh, term to describe what or who is targeted by discourse around disinformation. Uh, the idea of counter media incorporates a broad category of information outlets that are understood to stand in direct opposition uh, to normative ideas around news production and the media outlets uh, attached to those norms. So um, some of the characteristics of counter media have been described as um, explicitly opposed to the mainstream media um, and creating alternative, these are quotes now, creating alternative knowledge uh, which challenges establishment knowledge, replacing knowledge authorities with new ones, thus providing an opportunity for political mobilization. Um, further, it's um, counter media invokes both social mistrust and distrust in legacy news media, which creates opportunities to act outside normative professional news routines, producing alternative forms of knowledge. Um, and by doing so, this allows counter media to present themselves as a corrective to legacy media. So, as I think this description of counter media shows, um, efforts to ring fence deviant content in this global information flow have continued to fall short of their objectives. Qualifying attributes for labels remain fluid and arguably subjective. Um, I would argue that description I've just provided of counter media would not appear nefarious to many. <laughs> um, for this reason, it can be argued that the current focus on fixing truth in the flow of inf information through education campaigns, verification and fact checking could be of limited effectiveness. Um, some emerging voices, and I know that uh, Mark, you've already mentioned those, um, Farkas and Shao or Shu. I don't want to try to pronounce the second one, uh, have questioned the dominant arguments around the crisis and in information exchange online as uh, productive of a crisis in democracy. So they argue that in this formulation of democracy, uh, of this formulation, democracy has become synonymous with a singular truth and suggest that this poses a serious risk. By reducing democracy to truthful, for truthfulness alone, um, and I quote, what remains less clear is who or what the ability to uh, who or what has the ability to define such truths. Um, so such a information centric view of democracy ignores um, that power to define truth and the public the public sphere public sphere has always been contested. Um, it's arguably consistent. It's also arguably consistent with the de technocratic understanding of democracy that is oriented towards rule by information rather than rule by the people. So what falls by the way, a wave, wave side is a democratic tradition that understands the spheres where democracy is enacted as necessarily agonistic um, and comprising views and ambitions that are irreconcilable. Um, right. <laughs> so uh, this is where Baudrillard yeah comes in. Uh, Matrix, Baudrillard, obviously. Um, I'm not intending to argue that there is no truthful information. It's not the intention to downplay the existence of false information um, spread on social media platforms um, or indeed the reality or significance of its impact in sections of society and pol politics. Um, but I'm perhaps theoretically informed by, um, by Jean Baudrillard's understanding of the contradictions inherent in dominant ideas of participation. 
So under the dominant discourse around a disinformation crisis, what you know, meaningful participation demands that participants subscribe to a set of rules accepted to represent the production of meaning. And Baudrillard argued that the political elite, quote, continue, continually seeks to uh, perfect the reign of meaning, to invest, to saturate the field of the social. Um, while the, ma and, uh, the masses continually distorts every effect of meaning, neutralizes or diminishes them. Um, so perhaps this nonsensical hyper-participation is arguably the revenge of the mass. Um, so what I've really done is I've described an overview of some of the characteristics bes bestowed on speech on social media um, during the century and the present day perception of a crisis point that requires specific forms of intervention. Um, I've tried to reflect on an institutional history that saw an initial convergence between professional journalism and social media platforms um, that was leaning towards an enthusiasm for participation as an expression of democracy and action, followed by a period of moving apart, and now what appears to be a renewed but discursively restructured convergence. And really what I'm proposing is to examine uh, this history closely and to address the power relationships between these two important segments of the media industry and how they have been ordered and reordered. On time. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much. Um, and our final speaker this evening is uh, Aaron Green. Aaron, I uh, first encountered a couple of years ago when he uh, made a submission to Irish Communications Review that just blew my mind. I didn't know quite what to do with it except to uh, try to take it all in. And um, since that time, I've been fortunate enough to work more closely uh, with Aaron, and uh, he is uh, close to completion of his uh, of his PhD with us here, uh, where he is working very much on questions of semantic communication and information theory uh, from a um, from a philosophical standpoint. Sorry, I just try to uh, get back to this. Stop sharing. And Aaron is a lawyer. But we won't hold that against him, as they say. And he is um, works in uh, compliance law, uh, corporate compliance law, and has the um, the unenviable task of explaining uh, law to software developers and explaining software to lawyers uh, in his in his day to day role. And that is what really brought him to this interest in the, uh, in information and the question of uh, of how information works and doesn't work so uh aaron also has the um has the unenviable task of negotiating a business environment as a person with autism uh and uh we are really looking forward to him getting to share this really uh, fascinating research that he's been doing or at least a small part of it for the next 15 minutes aaron green thanks very much Thank you, thank you, Harry. Thank you all for being here. Um, as Harry mentioned, I'm autistic, so I'm super gullible. Um, so disinformation actually has a very, very deep place in my heart. Um, I think as a, a, a part of my work definitely has to do with kind of trying to understand um, how to manage um, when people are being um, earnest and when they're being ironic and um, so I just wanted to, to get started. Um, I wanted to talk about opposite day. And that's something I think we've all sort of been there um, on the playground as kids. And I think that that's sort of where where the notion of disinformation all kind of comes together. Um, this is just taken from tvtropes.com. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I, I um, it's, a, it's a great place for snippets about um, tropes. Opposite day is not the special day when everyone does the opposite of what they would normally do. On opposite day, which everyone agrees happens on a specific day of the year, you always tell the truth and do everything the same as usual. So just a quick show of hands. Was that true? <laughs> Was it false? But did you understand it? Did it make sense? <laughs> Um, so I think that the point is that there's a, 
a way that communication doesn't necessarily come in truth or falsehood. In fact, most of it is neither in some deep way. And so I think part of my investigation is trying to think of um, what, what is it? What's going on? If, you know, if we're not just telling the truth, not just lying, um, what's, what's underlying and how, you, how do you build on that? Um, so one of the most spectacular bits of, and I don't even know if it's properly disinformation. Um, I'll, let, I'll leave you to judge it. Um, it's during the during the pandemic, Howard Stern uh, um, made fun of some people who died who were sort of vaccine um, protesters who were publicly against the uh, vaccination who died of COVID-19. Um, and this is just um, on Breitbart News. There was a commenter just it's sort of, uh, this is about Howard Stern um, in, in response to Howard Stern. So do you know why I think Howard Stern is going full monster with his mockery of three fellow human beings who died of the coronavirus? Because leftists like Stern and CNN and Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and Anthony Fauci are deliberately looking to manipulate Trump supporters into not getting vaccinated. Nothing else makes sense to me. In a country where elections are decided on razor thin margins, does it not benefit one side if their opponents simply drop dead? Mm -hmm. If I wanted to use reverse psychology to convince people not to get a life saving vaccination, I would do exactly what Stern and the left are doing. I would bully and taunt and mock and ridicule you for not getting vaccinated, knowing that the human response would be, hey, F you, I'm never getting vaccinated. So like at first, I didn't know what to make of that. Because like clearly the writer is trying to get people vaccinated. It's not disinformation. And yet the way they're doing it is touching on all of the tropes of conspiracy theory, right? It's a conspiracy theory intended to get people to actually get vaccinated. And so I think it's a double reversal. So the writer is using a reversal to imply that the audience should get vaccinated without having to say that they should get vaccinated because they won't believe you if you say they should get vaccinated. But they might believe that a leftist is telling them to get vaccinated so that they will not get vaccinated so that they will die. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, that's that's my interpretation. But again, you can see how there's a, a potential here for just continuous reversals. <clears throat> so one of the really interesting things, and this is again just a snippet from, um, this is the late show with Stephen Colbert, um, the media analyst Brian Stelter from CNN was just, they were just talking about uh, Fox News in general, and he said, um, Stelter said the, the place has been radicalized, and that's one, it's one thing when it comes to normal politics, but when we're in the midst of a pandemic and they are pushing vaccine misinformation, that is beyond the pale. And Colbert responds, well, why would they do that? Because a lot of their viewers are, you know, older. And it doesn't seem like a great business model to kill your viewers. Seltzer said, I wouldn't run a business that way. And I think Fox News has this automatic contrarianism. Just whatever Biden says, do the opposite. Whatever Brian Seltzer says, be the opposite. Whatever Stephen Colbert says, do the opposite. And it works, I guess, when you're debating infrastructure, but not in a pandemic. And Stelter here, I think he's being tongue in cheek to some extent, but he's hit upon something that's that's really kind of fundamental, um, and, and that's just how easy it is to contradict. Um, and I wanted to, sorry, I just want to get some more. Um, I have one more, one more quote. <laughs> Um, and it, it kind of, it, it pulled me back to, I'm a big Monty Python fan, I don't know if um, you know the Argument Clinic well, but I just wanted to, to, to throw out this one bit of the Argument Clinic. Um, it's sort of in the middle, and this is, this is sort of the point um, where, okay, so the man says, I came here for a good argument. No, you didn't. You came here for an argument. But an argument isn't just contradiction. Well, it can be. No, it can't. An argument is a connected series of statements intended to establish a proposition. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's not just contradiction. Look, if I argue with you, I must take up a contraposition. 
Yes, but it isn't just saying no, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. An argument is an intellectual process. Contradiction is just the automatic gainsaying of any statement the other person makes. No, it isn't. <laughs> so I have this sense that, and this is the point, is that what, what Python is getting at is that it, it's incredibly easy to simply contradict, and there's no way to distinguish between what is a contradiction and what is an argument, deliberate statement that actually means something. And so what Fox, and I think uh, to a large extent, the, the sort of broader media in general, um, and I think Rupert Murdoch has kind of built a business model around this, is that it's incredibly efficient to simply take whatever's out there and reverse it. And by reversing it, you are absolved from responsibility, right? You're no longer, you're not plagiarizing. You've done something. You're, what you've said is different, but it's just reversed. And it actually doesn't matter what you're reversing. So I don't know if you remember, but initially, um, when COVID first started kind of spreading, um, most of Fox News's uh, analysts were sort of pro- uh, shut down like they wanted to now they wanted to stop immigration anyway but but they were sort of they, they were making a big deal out of it that we should do something about it because it's a foreign virus coming over and then but once the sort of um, at, at that point the the medical establishment was saying don't worry it's going to be okay we've had fire like we've had um, epidemics before don't do anything drastic. But once the, the sort of establishment started to say that we do need to do something, then that's when it flips to we don't need to do anything. Right. And so you see this pretty consistently across um, certainly at, at, at Fox and, and I imagine at more sort of established um, media organizations as well. Um, is that there's just a, a very easy uh, process where they can take whatever information is out there and re reverse it. And by doing that, you sort of have a story and you didn't have to do any work and you can get people's attention. And I suppose that's the bigger picture is that by reversing whatever's out there, you've made something provocative. Even if it doesn't mean anything, you've sort of made an argument. Um, and, and I think that is one of the bigger issues that if media is entirely just about attention and getting attention, reversal is enough. Um, and that's that's all you really have to do. Um, and it's not new. I, I guess that's one of the things you know uh, everyone here has said. There's nothing new really going on right now. I, and I think we're paying attention to it because we're paying attention to media in general because Twitter is this big thing. Um, and it's really easy. I think part of it is that it is really easy to kind of um, see stuff on Twitter and see stuff on Facebook and, and they are very centralized. And so there's a sense in which, um, again, it is there, there's an industrial concern with the process. Um, but but it like there's a really good when when Donald Rumsfeld died, Errol Morris wrote uh, his obituary of him. I just wanted to take a clip of this because, um, again, it just shows the historical um, existence. So President Nixon was undone by his attempts to conceal and excise the official record. Mr. Rumsfeld knew better by the time he was serving under Mr. Nixon's successor. The trick was to marginalize the record, to litter it with so many contradictions that a rebuttal to any future historian would always be found. His memos, which were known as yellow perils in the Nixon administration and as snowflakes under Ford, would pile up in drifts, disguising the underlying historical landscape. It's a level of genius that has not been acknowledged in the press. The founder of the Freedom of Information Act is the guy who figured out how to render it almost totally worthless. I think of Mr. Rumsfeld as the epistemologist from hell. What are the grounds for rational belief? As often as not, the goal of Mr. Rumsfeld was not justifying belief, but undermining it. So I suppose then the question is, how does anything work? Right? If, if everything is reversible, 
How is it possible to have discourse at all? Because clearly we do have discourse, right? It's not like, I mean, there's, there's plenty of theories of, of nominalism and kind of ab absolute, um, what is it, nihilism, maybe. Uh, but, but in the end, we do talk, right? We're here, <laughs> people still go to college. <laughs> um, and again, like as an autistic person, it's not like I can't communicate, right? There is the possibility. Um, it's difficult and strange, but it's still possible. And so I think one of the things that I kind of have always come back to is this: it does work. So we need to keep trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so does anyone here know how blockchain works? No, yes, yes, sort of, maybe. Yeah, um, I mean, really, you can't know because the whole thing about blockchain is that it's not something you're allowed to know. And that's why it works. <laughs> if you, um, and and this is this is kind of um, this is the point. Um, and when I, I've always had this idea of trying to. To, trying to, to paint the shape of clouds, but not like you know the fluffy shape, the the way that clouds illustrate all of the different bits of the atmosphere and how they move. And one of the things that's always struck me is it's quite consistent, even though clouds there's no shape to them, right? What is the shape of a cloud? Um, there is no shape, but you can always recognize one, and that was sort of the start. Um, and at some point I stumbled on the Navier-Stokes um, equations and then um, in particular Taylor-Rayleigh instability, which is the shape that clouds make when they're quite unstable, where you have like a thunderstorm. And it's so consistent, even though it's entirely uncontrolled and quite turbulent. And I suppose that's the, the point. And over time, I've sort of pieced it together that what you're looking at is the image of a system approaching maximum entropy. And I won't actually go into that because that, I tried to explain it to my brother and it took three weeks. Um, but the point is that there is this thing that's on the other side of what we think of as kind of logic. and. The way I like to describe maximum entropy and entropy in general is as sort of the Russian reversal of logic. And I don't know if you know what a Russian reversal is, but um, I, Yakov Smirnov is a great um, Ukrainian comedian. Um, but he had this uh, thing in America, you can always find a party. In Russia, the party always finds you. Um, and then that's sort of the, the traditional Russian reversal. But then when you think about it, the, the beauty of looking at things that way, it's really about reversing the subject and the object. And so you can ask this question when you reverse that dynamic to ask, OK, who is actually acting on what? What is what is doing what is being done? And as you do that over and over, you sort of reverse the roles of subject and object. You begin to see more. Uh, uh, an environment as opposed to objects acting on other objects. So um, maybe another really nice Russian reversal is under capitalism, man exploits man. Under communism, it's the other way around. <laughs> and so what you see there is that actually the system is not so very important. It's the it's the exploitation that it's that's the that's the point, right? It's um, so if we think of logic as if X, then Y, you can think of entropy as um, given X, what is the expectation that there will be Y? And when we when we look at it that way, we see that we don't really know whether X produces Y or Y produces X or Y. And we often find, I think that's why blockchain works again, is because it's irreversible. And that's the point is that it doesn't, we don't get a system where there's one thing happens after the other. We don't have a logic to it. 
we have a complete map and it's very complete. Um, and so that's sort of my work and I'm glad I'm at the end of my paper. <laughs> um, but the, the thing that I want to leave you with is just that it's the image that you use and not the information itself to confirm the sort of completeness of the system. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Aaron. That is just fantastic. And um, we will we will carry on for for another little while because I do want to uh, give people an opportunity to to ask questions and uh, indeed for the panelists to talk to each other and to to uh, bring out some of how these ideas work together. So can I ask everyone to come up? Don't sit on Jenny's computer, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> And uh, for those who, who are watching the recording, um, I'm going to keep the recording running, but uh, apologies in advance. Uh, obviously, there's going to be people speaking who are not quite as on microphone as uh, as they've been up to now. So we'll see how the rest of this session goes on, on, uh, on the recorded version. So um, I'm going to throw it straight open to the audience. Uh, I, I will have some backup questions if you guys don't, but please, yes, Eugenia. Um, thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed all the presentations. Um, very uh, thoughtful. Both. I have a question for the first two panelists, Elena and Mark, uh, if I may. So I was very interested in and completely agree with your um, perspective that. A lot of like you know that disinformation discourse in fact is a as Mark uh, evocatively put it like a redemption story for mainstream media and journalism. However, I want to put it to you that the problem still remains. That still we have like um, and also perhaps the problem is exacerbated in the sense that because of the mainstream, if you want, because of the mainstream kind of like inability to serve the needs of the public, we have now a new kind of like public. Uh, evolving or emerging that is using the tools of media criticism to set up a kind of like a parallel public sphere in which like um, you know uh, we encounter reversals as as, uh, as facts um, not facts perhaps but but as alternative kind of like um, views um, and I have a lot of quotes because I'm looking into this kind of like a far right public sphere at the moment uh, for example, the idea that uh, they are looking to set up global communism along with super capitalism. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to um, ask what you thought about this and, and how can we, as thinking publics or as critical publics, reclaim the tools of criticism um, for, for, the, for the politics of emancipation? I think on the whole, the existence of this other sphere uh, is more a good thing than a bad thing. Um, it's it, because it's not all the far right either. Um, a lot of the counter narratives um, to either the far right counter narrative or the liberal center that I was concentrating on, there, there's a, there's a, there, there are other versions that also employ the, um, the tools of media criticism to uh, project a more truthful picture. And I think that, um, I mean, I, I find on the whole, it's a good thing that this other sphere is there, that it's, it, it, it's wider, it's to the right, to the left, it's all around it. But there are all of these other counter narratives and a lot of them, yes, are employing um, a lot of um, the tools of media criticism. Um, and I just think that, that that's a good thing um and that we have to expand the one and of course we do have to address the other um but i just feel so angry about you know the liberal centers um panic and um arrogance about this that they alone should be the ones to uh, set the terms of the public discourse and how dare all these other people well i'm one of those other people and and this whole there's a whole sphere out there that, that I think is a really healthy counterbalance to this mainstream narrative. It's how I know a lot about you know the world that I wouldn't know otherwise because uh, I don't have direct experience of many things that I want to know about. 
and it is through social media and all the things that I click on through, you know, my Facebook and Twitter feed every day that I find out a lot of things that I need to know. I'll put people on the right to that too. But is it the is it the job of the Liberal Center to decide, you know, what the terms of this are? So basically, my answer to that is we have to engage in the debate. You know, we have to to you know put forth a narrative that we think is a more honest, truthful narrative about what's happening in in some sphere or other, and argue with the liberal, you know, uh, the liberal center as well as the far right. But I don't think it's the job of the media platforms or this, you know, the mainstream media um, to to dictate the terms of that. But I feel differently about public service broadcasting, which is why I I concentrated on it, and I'm glad Mark did as well, because it is very powerful, and it it belongs to us, not just to them. That's why I concentrated because we have a right to demand more of it. And and you know, if the independent media do something rather, it's privately owned, and we can be critical of it. But we have a different relationship to RTE, and and you know, to to BBC and and ERT in in, in Greece. We have we have a right to demand that that more of the voices that we think are speaking. Um, in a more truthful way, to have access to public service media and not just the margins of the social media. Mark? Yeah, uh, I, <clears throat> yeah, I echo all of that. And to respond to what your main point there, we're still left with the problem. And this was this was kind of a line I cut to my own thing. It's that, okay, you know, myself and Elaine, we can puncture that certainty of the liberal centre and how it, you know, how it approaches these questions. But yes, we are left with um, in, an internet communication system that uh, has all sorts of problems associated with limitations, some of which seem easier uh, and more tractable than others. Um, and um, as far as public service goes, certainly, um, you know, the first step, I guess, is to, you, may, you know, uh, I guess, um, I mean, media criticism um, has to be not viewed with the kind of suspicion that it automatically is. I mean, having gone into RT and so on and done observations can be inherent suspicion. Even looking at stuff is suspicious inherently. Um, and there's no media literacy, no media program to that media. To, to inquire about media is to do something suspicious, right? Effectively, maybe I'm overstating a little bit, but I think we need to get past this point where actually <laughs> querying and questioning these things is it, there is a suspicion attached to that. And, and, and secondly, um, clearly, there is a need for the global challenges we have. The many, many domestic and global challenges. We need some sort of communication system that can trans transcend national boundaries, but it can also um, better mediate the, the fractured societies we have. And you know, the internet is clearly going to be what does it. It's not going to be analog broadcast media. And um, there is a need to reimagine what the public, what the public option is going to be. The public service model is is 100 years old last week. In the BBC, um, it hasn't really evolved all that much in terms of in terms of a lot of the norms. Um, so you know there are ideas like Christian Fuchs has put out public service internet model. There's certain ideas in there, but but absolutely, I mean, I think what what you're saying there is we are still left with uh, you know a media environment uh, with with numerous problems, and that's the conversation I would like to move on to. But it's just that when it comes to the public service side. Our, our, our kind of starting point is so limited, and you can see it in the strategic planning, the legislative stuff we've got, the future media commission. The, the future is the present with bells on. You know, we need to actually reimagine it more, more fundamentally, and and that's certainly part of the picture. But you're dead right to, to raise that. Usually, I think. Before I come back to the rest of the panel, I want to see if there's other questions uh, from the, from the floor, since that question was directed to those two in particular. Yes, Clean. A lot of things to me that exposing our age on a formulaic version of real news. How do you how do you see the way they fit in in terms of um, fake news or disinformation? Do you think that should be done on it, or do you think that the role the role of trying to establish trust in media is to educate people into actually what they are? 
Maybe I'll let Jenny and Aaron start on, on that one. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, um, actually, like my, my take on it is really the, the pedagogical first speaker question. I mean, I think if you, we are educated in a way that assumes uh, the information is given. When, when I like when my kids started school, one of the things that I noticed is that their physical intuition diminished. Their sense of the physical reality of the world diminished. Their sense of information and data was definitely aroused. And that sense that data is given and the, I think the privilege is it um, really goes back much further than just trying to educate about the media. Um, because I think at that point it's almost too late. Right? When if if data is is privileged over physicality, over the experience of the world, over um, I, I think your embeddedness in your lo location, even um, what we have is um, again it's so easy to reverse whatever it is. So it's spectacular. Um, so it is that sense of physicality. One really good example is when the um, the not Petya virus. I don't know if you remember that. Um, it took over and it spread, and it completely debilitated nurse shipping. And they were only able to recover their sort of main system because there was one version of it in Ghana, where um, the location had been offline because there was a problem. And what they did was they just started piecing things together physically by using whatever they could to stop, um, to get labels on the so packages. And it, it became, it went back to being a physical business. So it was the failure of the data system that saves the, the model. Um, and so I, I think there is the sense, my sense of it is, is really about saying, okay, don't privilege the data. Right? If we have a culture where data is privileged, it's already too much. We can't uneducate that. So anyway, that's that's really like I would take a step back from you know, media studies to what is language, what is matter, what are you what are you here to do? And so, yeah, I think I think it's a very deep. Jenny, um Jenny, is there Well, I think, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, sorry, which people? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. One attracts those those groups to actually look at point art. Yes. In, yeah. In terms of, I think those media that that sort of that area is very simple. Like I think it's attractive because it's so cool. In in a sense, um, again, it gives you the information that you. Already, you already know about it. You already, you already get into it. Yeah, I think there's an aesthetics. Yeah. Uh, and, and and Aaron's work deals with this uh, to some extent, but the, the the importance of understanding the aesthetic dimension of, of information. Um, uh, sorry, Jenny, go on. Um, well, I mean, I don't have any answers, but I am very skeptical about the idea of educating. Um, I'm not sure that it. I think on a feeling level for the people who apparently need educating, um, it misses the point. Um, and I'm, I'm now thinking about something else. I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, the whole Pegida movement in Germany, which was in East Germany, and the kind of people that were attracted to it. And, um, and I'm really seeing a sort of demographic that I th think felt hugely disowned um, and disowned in media representations of their own experience. Um, and I think that was actually that that's re I I see it more as a protest. Um so yeah, I'm I'm not sure that educating is really the way to go. So where does that Jenny, I want to ask you specifically, maybe even following up on Eugenia's question, where does that leave kind of media critique and people like us, uh, academics who you know want to intervene in this, but maybe want to do it in a way that doesn't empowers the liberal center in the way that uh, Helena has been talking about. Is there a way of doing doing critique in this space 
that isn't just a redemption narrative for journalism, isn't just boosting a liberal center, isn't just re-empowering the social media companies with a new discursive arrangement. Is there anything to be done? Um, well, is there anything to be done? I mean, I mean, like, if I'm now thinking of the example that I just gave, um, I, I think one of the things that would potentially um, is, is a broader representation, a broader representation of experiences of voices or, uh, in, in the, you know, in the mainstream media or whatever you want to call it. Um, and just, you know, that, that, that actually rings true to some sections of society who don't, do not feel represented, I think. Rings true is such a good phrase, actually, in this context. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very challenging one, I think, from the perspective of everything that we've been talking about. Where, do, where does the ring of truth have to do with, with what's real? But I think that. Well, uh, well, yeah. well but but you see, the, 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 when when there's such a disconnect, well, when there is at times such a disconnect between people's experiences and what they're being told is the truth. Um, then you've also got to ask what, it, what, what, what how, how truthful is that so-called truth then? You know, there is, there is, a, there is, like, this. just. Any, any other questions from the floor? Anybody want to intervene in this uh, discussion? Yes. I suppose one sort of point I can make is, is that <clears throat> at the onset of social media, is, is there a lot of, you know, rage and sort of terror from the sort of people who had, had power in the mainstream media who controlled like these people in mainstream media and the people who own and control them have such a huge amount of power at one stage and now it's quite clear that, that power is eroding and um, sort of campaigns against fake news are really just forlorn efforts to, to try and sort of recoup that power that they once had. Um, just wondering what the contributors um, um, I was trying to argue that. Yes. Exactly. I think that's the case. Um, I do. Um, I think, and that, that's the, the argument in the, the Gratich article about this whole war of restoration, um, uh, the whole emphasis on disinformation is the, the liberal center trying to recoup its power because it's still very powerful, by the way. It's still very, very powerful. <laughs> Um, and even on social media, it's still very powerful, not just in, in mainstream media. But like it's, you know, it's not so uncontested as it once was, and it's um, it, it's fighting back against that. And I, I want to get back to this question about education as well, which is related to this. I mean, you know, I I think you know there, there's a there's a there's a battle there um, to fight for this space in social media. Um, and to fight for space on the mainstream media as well. I think education, you know, and using the tools of media criticism has a huge role to play. First of all, in, in you know, our, our role as educators in, in universities. Uh, but I also think that we should use social media to the maximum advantage and we should take advantage of any openings there are for us um, on mainstream media. And my phone doesn't ring very often anymore, but it you know, once upon a time it did. Yeah. But like, um, you know, I think there's a space that was once there that's closing down. RTE actually used to do uh, book reviews, media criticism programs, and like, you, you know, things that, that have just really closed down. I actually got a call from RTE a couple of years ago to ask me to come in and um, to do an on-air launch, uh, not launch party, an on-air rap party for Love Hate. You know, there, there wasn't any kind of, you know, sense that, you know, I was a, I was a, a media critic that hated love hate. There was, I, and I did, I hated love hate. Um, and like there's this, I said, look, you know, that's, I'm not what you're looking for. You know, but like I used to be on to talk to, to review media, right. and that's completely disappeared. In the uh, I, I, September twelfth, two thousand one. The day after 9-11, I was going to be going, I was going on RTE at, at 10 o'clock and I was quite nervous that some of the things that I would have to say might not be too welcome. And I was in the taxi on the way out and I heard Helena on the previous hour. So Helena was on with Marion Finucane and then I was going to be on with Pat Kenny afterwards. And I thought, well, I guess there is space <laughs> for, for some of this. But yes, I mean, my phone doesn't ring too much from RTE anymore either. <laughs> Any other questions or points that people would like to make? The audience. 
Yes, Debbie. I just wonder what any of the panelists think about either the, the really constrained sort of the central media, and then also, I suppose, the utility of and, and, and the things that you can get out of social media, one another, but also I think the recognition of its constraints for proper deep, you know, the kind of stuff that you're talking about, that's to really expand the topic you can into. Do you think there's value in in podcasts as a kind of alternative format? Huge and utilized, critically engaged, going in that direction and finding a lot of value in that kind of deeper sort of story telling and mm -hmm. analysis. Yeah, when RTE isn't phoning me anymore, I'm getting requests to do podcast <laughs> interviews. So, you know, they're obviously, there is, a, it is a growing thing. There is an audience there that, you know, wants to go further. I think there's a worrying thing that um, that you know people don't read books anymore. I mean, people do read books, but like an awful lot of people who traditionally read books, like you know, not only university students, but even university lecturers aren't really reading books anymore. You know, there's a decline in this long form, um, which I regret. And you know, I'm, I'm, I still want to fight for books and write books and hope somebody can read them. Book but, has captured media, has <laughs> But um, I think it's interesting that you that you use podcasts. I think that that maybe is filling a bit of the space that, mm. that books once filled for people, um, because it 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 definitely requires a longer attention span and and more space to explore. So yeah, I think that that that's a good thing. Mark, yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and I think I think I think the potential of podcasts mm. need to. I mean. Again, coming up from a public service point of view, I think it's a good example. Uh, pod, you can do anything with podcasts, it can be any format, any events, on any topic. What do we have, right? RT offer your politics, <laughs> soft focus interviews with politicians, laid back, chill there, <laughs> right? Okay. Brexit Republic, the ultimate nerdery uh, around EU law, Northern Protocol. It has value, right? It's good, it's quality on its own terms. A podcast about the US politics, which is very much you know, the kind of standard liberal centrist, uh, really democratic so. horse race, kind of democratic party centric stuff. Fine again, it's on terms, right? But that's kind of it, right? In terms of in terms of news and current affairs, uh, which is helped for such a special category. So there's, there's no innovation there. Um, the, you know, even the, 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 the Truth Matters thing, they, they did a four part series uh, where they, you know, a few minutes each. I mean, this is just, this is podcast as marketing. Um, Podcast could could open up the doors to to a much broader range of participants in public media. I could public. This is something we should be able to apply to, to to produce podcasts. Open up the doors of the podcast studios and let us apply. Let us propose programs. Let us make our own media. This is what it could be, uh, but it's still on the broadcast model. So I think I mean I listen to podcasts all day every day. I fall asleep with podcasts in my ear, uh, which is probably a bit weird, but I think a lot of people do it, um, and uh, it's one obvious avenue. For digitalizing uh, some sort of public intervention in the media system that is completely undertapped at the moment. And part of it, just to finish, is the financial thing. I mean, it's easy to say it's all ideological failure, right? and, and it, a, lot, a lot of it is. But if you look at the papers today, there's 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 letters from RT's director general to the Taoiseach saying you're actually killing us by not funding us, right? And and um, you know, it's easy to say. Um, Oh well, Eastern European, Eastern Europe is where uh, governments interfere and manipulate and interfere with public media. We're in Ireland, we have an independent media system that, you know, RT has its challenges with the government and everything. Fundamentally, it's independent. Look at the funding side; they're killing it. They're preventing it from reinventing itself for, for the future. Mm. And that, to me, is just a serious an intervention. At the very moment, it needs to reinvent or die uh, if that's being prevented. So I think you know the podcast side is a, is a really good point to us. It's a good kind of sense of okay, that is actually what media critic media criticism is about, is about finding the avenue forward. Like and it's not just about sort of criticizing what's already there. It's there is a lot going on that is not necessarily that is more accessible. Um, that you know it takes time and effort to find things that are relevant. And so I think there is kind of maybe the Goal of the criticism is not just to critique the status quo, but to say actually that there are new things to look for. Them. 
So look, we're about 20 minutes over time here, and you guys have been a great audience and, and great panel as well. Thank you to, to everyone and uh Dong. I'm sure we'll carry on the conversation uh, as we as we leave and um, if it's possible, it's not too many of us here, if it's possible that some of us might be wandering over in this down better direction. <laughs> and uh, so um, it's it's been really lovely to have you all here, and uh, we will hope to see you again at future uh, future events here. Thanks very much. And I'm going to turn off the call here as well, or the uh, the meeting.